I got to live a pretty good life. Smoke with Woody Harrelson, like Charlie Sheen. We got a whole bunch of people to come out. We found a doctor willing to sign and licenses to grow before it became legal. And that's how I got Woody's attention because that I was getting people hadn't seen since high school. It was probably a million and a half in business every year. Born in New Jersey, raised in upstate New York. I was one of those kids, like, I was a skinny little kid. I got bullied a lot. So my, my dad taught me how to box and how to fight. So I got into school and I got in a lot of trouble because I wasn't afraid to stand up to people. You right. know, he was one of those type if, um, you know, he tried to go talk to the parent and if the parent wasn't reasonable, then he'd say, I'm, your son and my son are going to fight one-on-one -on -one and mutual combat right there, you know? So I started to, um, getting a little bit of trouble my dad went to jail he's in prison in and out what ended up happening was for me i just started running the streets and uh so i ended up going to like a reform school and uh how, how old I was were you 13 till i was 14 and a half and uh it was like a camp it was uh out in the middle of the mountains in New York. Most of the kids that were there were from like big cities, like New York City, like from all the boroughs. These were, you know, pretty right. bad kids. And me, I was just a kid, you know, I was getting in little troubles, you know. I was a lookout for a lot of guys and started to see like um, how other people lived. I had, this was the first time I had to live with all these other different cultures, you know, a lot of black, a lot of Puerto Rican, things right. like that. You know, it was another kid who was Italian in there and that was about it. Their big thing was um, corporal punishment. They could put their hands on you, you know, grab you, throw you up against the wall, right. um, make you do like a thousand push-ups, things like that. We ran calisthenics. It was just like being in the military. I remember we had these old um, wooden bunk beds, like military style. They're really heavy type of wood. It's some sort of hardwood. And I had to reach back behind my back and grab it. And my bunk mate had to grab the other one and we'd have to walk three feet, set it down, go back two feet, set it down and repeatedly. So it got us in really good shape. We weren't allowed to fight or anything like that, but they let us box here and there and stuff. And then when I was in there, you know, these guys showed me a lot of um, their hustles and kind of the things that got them in there. But for some reason, um, the staff there uh, had me doing little side things and they'd give me a break from the exercise and stuff like that. Let me go read books and things like that. But uh, I noticed they were kind of corrupt too. Like they'd send me in to do snacks and do the cooking and they'd keep me in the kitchen and doing laundry. And this went on for like a few weeks. And then one day the guy comes back with another guy. He says, um, here, this is the keys to my car. I need uh, five boxes of these uh, burgers and I need these buns. And they're basically just <laughs> stealing from the place right. to go to take to a tailgate kind of game and stuff like that. I was going to say they, they busted, they busted uh, the guy, one of the guys that ran the kitchen in one of the federal prisons. He'd opened up like a restaurant <laughs> and he was ordering <laughs> stuff for his restaurant yeah you know and he'd get it and like you've ordered so much of this so much of this and those five boxes are going to the restaurant and those two boxes are going to the restaurant and this went on for like 10 years or something until he's visually caught oh yeah but, wow. you know they people don't realize how much latitude they they have you know they're ordering they're given a budget and they work off the budget if they can you know if they can you know slide some to the side but typically the problem is they do that by not providing enough for you know, the, the inmates. Oh yeah. Oh, how, yeah. how old were you at this point? So I was like 13 and a half. And so, yeah, I was cooking breakfast. I was cooking lunch, things like that. Um, and I got pretty good at it. I remember a couple of the guys, they come in and I guess they, they got a bill for, uh, their meals if they ate there. So I made a bunch of food and it went out the side door for the staff and things right. like that, you know? And then, um, when I got back to uh, New York and I was going to middle school, I was in eighth grade and we were in gym class and he said uh, he wanted us to do like four or five push-ups. And I kind of laughed and he goes, hey, Sindone, he goes, uh, you think you could do that? And I laughed. I go, yeah, I could do a lot more than that. And I wasn't trying to be facetious or anything. I just... Um, 
was like, I didn't think 100 push-ups was a lot really at that point. I was in pretty good shape. So I busted him out. He said, you're making me feel old and tired. And so uh, I was always an energetic kid. And then a lot of kids moved to our city from New York um, and from Rochester and some of the big cities. And I had made connections when I was at this place. So uh, when these guys moved to town, I started to hang out with more big city kids, you know, kids with different things going on. And that's when I got into like just selling pot. And, you know, I was hosting a lot of parties. This is after you got out. So you yeah, got after out. After I got something. out. Yeah, so I was hosting parties. I was um I was going on road trips with my friends. We uh just go take cars for jewelry rides and stuff like that. You know? How old were you at this point? Fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah, fourteen and a half. Yeah, yeah. I actually ran into a friend at uh at St. Augustine. I grew up uh with his older brother and he's reminded me here I am at work, you know, because yeah, I remember your bro um you and my brother took that car and you went on that joy ride. Yeah, we kind of got caught, but the cops thought it was more uh, um, punitive, I guess, to let our parents deal with us than them to deal with us. So um, they had a meeting at my house and most of my friend's parents are divorced and they're with their partner and the other parent is there with their partners. They didn't want to be there. And then they just really reamed us out and stuff. So I started to straighten myself out, you know. But um, just got myself together, you know. Um, I got I had to go to one of those scared straight programs right. when I got back, and that was at Elmira Correctional Institute. That's the prison in my town. That's what. That's why everybody would move there from New York and Rochester and all that. And we started to have a, a rise in crime and things like that because they would their family would be so far away from them at the prison doing such a long term that it was just easier to move people to our town industry left we used to have a lot of really big industry there we had built fire engines and fire apparatus and then all that went away and our town kind of got like depressed and property values went down yeah i was gonna say uh, at, at coleman there are, are inmates that you know they get moved to coleman and their family will move to the the city or to uh you know one of the nearby towns because they know this guy's going to be here for like you know your wife moved there she's he's going to be here for five years. So I'm going to be visiting every week or two. Might as well just move, you know, but that's usually the guys that have money, but yeah. But when you go to these distressed towns or these other places, where do these people find uh, jobs or opportunities when they get yeah, there? You know, I was going to say, sometimes you're, sometimes they already have money because of whatever the crime is. The person is in there for, or they, okay. you know, they, they live in, you know, they're, you know, you're thinking, you're thinking more state level, well, yeah, at I, federal well, level, I guess there are more. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm saying in state level too, because think about it. If you're a state, like how hard is it? If how hard is it to go find a job making twenty bucks an hour? It's not that hard. Right. You basically go anywhere in the U.S. and find a job making twenty dollars an hour, sure. or at least close eighteen, twenty one. Right. Even if it's eighteen, it's gonna in a depressed area. Your rent's not that much. You know, if your boyfriend or husband or son is used to dealing drugs and you live in a lower, uh, you know, lower middle class area, then you can easily get up and move to Alabama next to the prison and get a job at one of those places and get the same kind of live in the same kind of, um, uh, you know, situation you just move from. And then he moves again, two years later, you move to that little town. Cause it's another one. They don't right. put these prisons in really upper class, nice areas. They're pretty no. low, you know? Yeah, that's true. I guess. So, you know, you can do that. And then the guys in the, in the federal system that do it typically are guys that they own five businesses. They cheated on their taxes. I'm not, and I don't mean cheated. Like I made a mistake, like blatantly just, right. you know, there's, Two hundred thousand dollars is eight hundred thousand dollars. I law I I sent off to this account in the Cayman Islands and said it didn't exist. Like you're done, bro. You're gonna do some. You're gonna you you're gonna do some time. Right. So, but they can afford. They've also got. They're also multimillionaire, so they can they can afford to up their their family and have a move across the country and buy a little house in this area. Their wife doesn't sure. work anyway. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. that happens. those circumstances. Yeah, that's fantastic. yeah. So sometimes it happens. Some sometimes people are just traveling. Yeah. You're gonna come see me every month or every other month, and you know, right? So I've definitely seen some guys, uh, people's families, you know, up and move and buy houses and sell their houses and everything. Oh, okay. Um, 
in the yeah, the state level, I could see how suddenly you get this criminal element that moves into your town to visit yeah. their relatives and the next thing you know, you know, <laughs> they're pulling over trucks, they're robbing trucks, they're breaking into houses, they're oh, yeah. selling drugs, they're making, you know, they're making uh they're setting up labs. Oh yeah. <laughs> grow houses. All that stuff going on right. back where I where I grew up. Yeah. I went back and it was unrecognizable. I, you know, I remember I was walking across the bridge and this other girl was walking across the bridge. So I was like, how you doing? And um I said, um, I haven't been in this town in like 20 years. I moved away. I said, where's there to go? Like, is there any places, any museums, anything going on? She's like, no, just a lot of drugs. And then proceeded to tell me about her addiction and all her friends and everything like that. And I'm like, I got to get the hell out of here. Spent like a day there and that was it. (laughs) You know, used to be a nice place, you know, mountains, you know, the mountains aren't there anymore. No, the, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but now they're being stripped and everything like that right. for pasture land and stuff like that. It just, I mean, even nature doesn't look as beautiful anymore right. there, you know. So that was unfortunate. But so, what that. happened? Did you end up graduating high school? Did you? So I graduated. Yeah, I okay. graduated, and then um, I went. I went out to Indiana. I'm going to uh, why? Co- just to go to college there, oh, just okay. to get away, and uh, so. I, I wanted to get far away from New York as I could, you know. I just wanted to maybe live in a small town and just, you know, just have a normal life, you know. Um, I was looking for a degree in, like, education, political science, you know. So I uh, wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And then I started doing home health care, and I started taking care of older people. and. There were some people connected out of Chicago, Italian family that hired me to uh, come take care of the mother. And uh, yeah, when the guy called, he was a bookmaker. I thought I was just going there, you know, to meet him. Maybe, wow, there's some business opportunity. How do you hear about me? But actually, they got my name off the list. So I started working there. And then a couple family members and I became close and I started to get, you know, better deals on on a pot. I started to smoke it. It was helping me relax, you know, and that. And then uh, when I'm doing the home health care, I noticed I was taking care of some patients that, uh, that, that used it. So they were telling everybody in the uh, rehab hospital, hey, there's this guy, Eddie, he works for this agency and he's cool. He'll get you weed. He'll make sure you get your medical dose. These guys are paralyzed from like the neck down. So I wasn't really that worried that, you know, I was going to get prosecuted, you know, on a big level (laughs) or something, you know, I bring these guys in as my witness, you know, and I get a sympathetic jury if I needed to. But so I started to do that and it, it started to spread. Like I started to go to the, um, um, other pot marches like the hash bash up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so wait a second. So you're selling, you're selling weed to people in the, um, in the nursing homes? No, these are people that lived in their own homes. Oh, okay. So what happened was oh, people that just needed home health care workers to just, come in just to make sure everything's okay, make sure they're taking the medication. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Make sure they have their breakfast. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was gonna say well, not was, in the nursing home, not okay. at all. So these guys are like 40, 45. You know, at that time these guys had graduated in 75, 76. So um couple, yeah, so they're like old hippies and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. and they they had um um they're like, wow, okay, you know, I'm going to be in this situation. They're paralyzed. One guy was a diving accident. It was actually like um, his graduation night from high school. He's like six foot five oh and he God. dove into a pool. Another guy diving off a boat, you know, when he was all high on whatever. And that's how he got injured. So there's so spinal cord injury guys mostly. But what happens, they were at the rehab hospital telling people, well, this agency I work for was struggling. Right. They were um, so by getting me to come in and take care of this guy and get him as a client, they were able to like stay afloat. Right. But now all of a sudden people that don't even need the service, but are qualified, they just want to have weed so they can wean themselves off of this other medicine and they could, you know, kind of have happier lives. So um, they start to call my agency and book me. I don't really have to do anything, but just show up. Okay. You know, and it was kind of crazy. Like the cable guy comes in to see this one guy. I'm in his room. I smoke him up. I leave. 
this guy can't use his arms. He has to, you have to put like a, a, a pencil with an eraser right here right. in his mouth. And then he can kind of write with his right. head. So the cable guy comes in and he's like, smells the place. It smells totally like weed, but this guy can't use his hands. He's trying to figure out how the hell the place right. smells like weed, you know? And uh, so I end up coming back and uh, yeah, then that guy ended up being a customer. And it just started to, to build up to where I was getting calls from all over the Midwest. And um, um, for example, I got in um, Ohio. I started to, to buy a lot and sell it there. I went to a Thanksgiving dinner. I'm with my girlfriend. We're on our way there. I run out of pot. I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot. We're five minutes from our house. Let's just go back and um, get my car and I'll drive, and I'll let you choose the music the whole way there. That was why she wanted to drive. So she says, no, finish what you got. We're going about four hours away, out in the middle of nowhere. My family are all clean cut. Um, you're not going to find any weed, so I'm going to see what a day of sobriety is like for you. I like, I go use this medicinally, really? And she <laughs> says, yeah. So... You know, she's not at school graduates, just really cool chick, but you know, weed wasn't really her thing at that time. So we get to their aunt and uncle's house and it's everything she describes. So we're there, we're talking about California. And uh, I said, yeah, I lived there for a little while. I was Southern California. And another guy says, yeah, I lived in Northern California. I go, oh, Humboldt. And he goes, ooh, Humboldt. That's where they grow some of the best pot. So he looks at me and I look at him. So I go to him, I go, Hey, do you got a little bit, man? I'll buy it from you. I just, uh, you know, I didn't get it. He goes, actually, I bought an ounce and my uh, girlfriend is telling me uh, that, you know, I shouldn't have spent so much. The holidays are coming up. She wanted me to get rid of it. So I go, we can get rid of it to me. <laughs> so my girlfriend comes out of the house and here I am in her car with her brother in the back seat, this Mexican guy in the passenger seat and me smoking up. Right. And, and, you, and you showed up with nothing. I showed right. up with nothing. And so um, I told her, I said, there's a power there. You know, you just got to manifest it. And then I started working in radio, too. And then that really kind of boosted my sales, too, because I was meeting a lot of people. The DJs were buying weed from me, you know. And right. I'd come up and sit and sit on the air in the radio station and just hang out, give shout outs to my friends. We'd order pizzas, you know, have the guys come up. I had one guy. He got we got him so high he left three pizza bags up there um at different occasions so i called the pizza place and said hey you know is wesley working and they're like oh wesley doesn't work here anymore and i said well i got three of his pizza bags over at my house and uh he left at the studio and he goes yeah that's kind of why we had to fire wesley <laughs> but they were i guess a few hundred bucks a piece so then we ended up getting some um, things but got to go down to jamaica with the um radio station and then of course that boosted business too you know i'm down there smoking we're talking on the air you know and i'm meeting all these people from all over the place and then i went to uh uh milwaukee through a marijuana march there and i met a bunch of people i met some girl in detroit that's probably i should back up how i kind of went from spreading across the midwest I met a girl from detroit she came down to pick some up from me and we went up there and i didn't realize the big three automakers um they're uh they have all kinds of pull up there even the kenny customs guy i talked to he said that uh they don't police them when stuff comes across the border they leave them alone um because it's such a big uh business for for both countries right stuff like that so she worked for one of the big three automakers and she got transferred to milwaukee so her mother wanted me to come out there and stay with her at her apartment for the first week so people see a guy coming and going from the place so now i'm up there and i'm dealing to all her friends and they're picking up a few pounds i'm going to the hash bash in ann arbor michigan and meeting the guys from high times and that so they're buying a bunch from me too because they can't travel with it where are you getting all this from still the italian guys some some of the italian guys but a lot of them were getting it from like um kentucky and uh the appalachians there's guys that are down there growing fantastic pot outdoor that rivals the indoor stuff from like california and that 
So I was getting it at a really cheap price. Like it was going for 350 for the high end from California, from British Columbia. And I was paying, or I was, I was selling it retail at two, 210. I was right. paying like $80 an ounce for it. So I was getting it pretty when, cheap. What when was this? So this would have been 96. Okay. Yeah. So then that starts happening. And then um I guess well no, 96 is about when I first got into it. About 99, 2000 is when I made the jump and went into Milwaukee. And then um as I would go to Milwaukee. I was doing the marijuana marches. I was meeting other people that did the marijuana marches and some of the activists from other cities. So those people were coming and buying from me. I joined like uh, uh, marijuana legalization um, groups like Normal and that too. So I'd show up at those and then I'd end up, uh, you know, selling to them. And I just basically wanted to make sure that uh, sick people got it in the beginning. And then the other people, friends and all that was sort of the supplement, you know, the the reduced price I could give to the medical patients. Right. And so then, you're not really working at this point, though. At this point, you're... I'm just working like part-time restaurants, just like, like I was telling you, like my uncle had told me one time, always let people see you working. No matter what you got going on, let people see you working. But isn't people, that also a good way to just meet people and get more customers yeah yeah that way too and it was really nice like say for example we had this uh i had some close friends that had a greek restaurant when the place was closed i had a key i could bring people in turn on the lights put out dinner for everybody have a little private party clean up and leave you know what i mean drop the owner a few bucks for doing it bag of weed you know like that kind of thing and then, but the thing with the weed is I started trading um, pounds um, with one guy and he was giving me Coke. And then that's when everything sort of really took off for me, you know? Right. And I didn't know what I was in for, you know, when I got into that game. Because it's a vastly different clientele. Oh, yeah. They're calling me all the time. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, yeah, totally different clientele, totally different clientele. And when I got to Canada, it got crazier. I mean, I had circus people that would come and buy it from me. And I'm sitting in my in room. In Canada? Yeah, in Toronto. And I don't want to give anybody away. I don't want to tell anybody. But um, we're, I, I'm in my house. There's about to be a big performance. It's like a cabaret show. You know, you got vaudeville, burlesque, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Okay. And um, imagine all the freaks from art school, you know, and, and, and the circus and everything all combined music. And so we're in there and I have these guys from uh, these French guys. They're working for an Italian company. And I was told, make sure if they need anything, and I mean anything, you take good care of them, we'll take good care of you. So they wanted some high quality coke. So I get it for them. I'm breaking it up on the table and a couple guys walk in and one of them was a clown, takes off his nose, does a line of coke, <laughs> does another one, puts his nose back on, says, all right, see you later walks out the door and these guys are just like baffled you know like did we just see what we fucking thought right. we saw and that i wasn't even trying to get back into the business but it, i sort of through that network got back into the coke when i thought i wasn't going to sell it anymore what happened was they're throwing some after after party and i'm there and some guy offered me some and i looked at it, i was like no i got a little bit at home I could um, get, and he goes, oh yeah? And I go, yeah, it's not bad, I'll go grab it. I had this Russian girl that I used to see once in a while, so I always kept some at the house in case she came by. It really wasn't my thing, I'm more of a pilot. And so I went over and I broke some up, and the guy says, holy shit. And I said, yeah, I said, Do you, I said, you like it? And he goes, yeah, he goes, look, I got a music producer and he's looking for some. It's like, he wants to get a few ounces, you think you could make that happen? 
I said, I probably could make a phone call. I don't know. I've never asked for that much, but let's see. So the party goes on until about 7, 7.30 in the morning. So I call my buddy then, and I, or I text him, and I say, hey, I need to talk to you. He calls me like five minutes later. And I ask him if he can get the three for me. He says, sure, no problem. So he brings it to my house. So around noon, I call these guys and say, hey, I got that. And they're like, whoa, you got it already? And I'm like, yeah, you told me you wanted it. I got it. He says, look, man, we didn't need it for a few weeks. We were just kind of giving you a heads up. I go, well, this is a lot of money. I got to have my money roll and then making more money with my other th projects. And so he goes, hold on. I'm going to call you back in 10 minutes. I got a solution. Guy ended up giving me like 20 customers. They took from the old guy because I guess his stuff wasn't that good. Right. And next thing I'm back in the business again. And... I'm dating a stripper, which didn't make it any better, you know, because then she's taking it to the club. I had the girls buying lots of weed and coming over to the house, you know, but, um, and since I was buying weed and some of I was getting from, from some biker guys and that I would have, um, she had a stripper pole in the studio, which was awesome. So I get to watch her, you know, do her thing and swirl on up there and you know, twirl. So it was a tough life. Yeah, it's you know, <laughs> I'm cooking dinner for everybody. They like the vegan food because it's giving them, you know, back, you know, some shape and that kind of thing, you know, some tone and that. My girlfriend went from like a size nine to a size three, you know, not drugs, just from, from that type of eating, you know. And I was told her I kind of own her image and likeness because of me, you know, I got her, you know. <laughs> a little more hip and whatever she wasn't a stripper when i met her but i think she was on her way to doing it she was studying uh sex work and uh legalization of uh prostitution and that working on a court case so she's in school for a phd she's finishing her um um all that her school this is uh, her dissertation she's working on her dissertation so she's got all these books like Cop to call girl, wisdom of horse, um, paying for it, you know, a John's perspective. Well, all these books, you know, I'm like, what the fuck? So uh, we discovered that the um, lawyer who's representing all the legalization for marijuana cases, the one we're all calling, um, is the same lawyer that's handling those cases. So when I would go to the, uh, most of those girls were my, were my customers. They bought stuff from me. So when I would go to these things, the speeches and she'd have, or the university, I, or get togethers, gatherings at the court case, I'd know a lot of who the girls were. I'd know them personally, that kind of thing. Right. So, um, what I would do is, uh, the guys I was getting my weed from or my Coke from, I'd have them come over to my house and the girls were kind of a way to get them to hang around. And she says, you got the money. Why do you keep paying them little by little and having them come on over three times a day? But see, what she didn't realize was that was my way of not paying for security. You know, I had these guys coming over to my house collecting the money. I didn't have to pay for guys to, to protect me or anything like that. I always had guys around. So if I had to have stuff at my house, because I did get home invaded one time and a uh, guy came in with a gun to rob me. And uh, I had to fight the guy off. And actually, the guy was a lot bigger than me. And uh, we found out who sent him. I don't know who the guy was who did it. But um, I, uh, I got into his voicemail. I had a girl that I know act like she was interested in him, a working girl, go spend time with this guy and uh, make him feel, you know, boost his ego a lot. So she figured out what his password was when he entered it. So I went in and I changed it. And since it was a burner phone, he couldn't call the phone company and get it reset. So um, we called pretty much everybody that left him messages that we could get a phone number for and basically told him what he did. And then <laughs> <laughs> ran him out of business. Yeah. Um, okay. So so where where does this go don't you you eventually go to canada so no so i'm in canada so oh, you're I, in canada so i get to canada yeah did i miss that did i miss that part like, oh I, I guess i guess i i i was just i mean you draw, said the I circus I, people were i was drawing yeah i was drawing a parallel oh okay. i guess I and, I and so i kind of got sidetracked can canada. so i moved there i actually stayed there for uh almost 15 years 
Yeah. Did you ever get arrested in Canada? So I did. I got um, one time. They got me. It was mistaken identity. They were looking for some a guy, I guess a guy from Italy, and they thought I looked like him. And they stopped me at a train station. And because I had some pot on me, um, they uh, and I was American. They seemed to not like Americans up there. <laughs> they ran my name and ended up having a DEA guy come in and interrogate me. And all he wanted to know was, am I bringing anything back and forth across the border? Which I totally wasn't. Right. I had nothing to do with any part of that. Not seeds, not weed, not anything like that. Um, and so... Um, I did run a little tour company where I took people to the pot cafes, to the pot church, you know, that kind of thing. Um, what is it? It's it wasn't legal totally, but it was a gray area of legality at that time. It's totally legal now. It's been legal for I don't know five years or something like that. Okay. Federally, federally legal in Canada. In Canada, okay. So, um, yeah, what well, because. What we were doing was, um, well, when I got arrested, so the DEA guys come in, they're um, screaming and yelling at me. And I didn't even know they could legally operate outside of the, I mean, U.S. like they, you know, I didn't know anything about that. I'm like, what the hell are they doing in Toronto? So the guy's yelling at me about an overturned drug charge. Well, I had gotten caught once in Indiana and my lawyer got um, everything, um, like, what would you call it? Um, like I pled guilty and then the charge got dismissed if I don't get in trouble within a couple of years. Right, so you, you go, if you complete probation, then it wasn't it, probation even. Oh, okay. It was just two years. Don't get in any trouble. Okay. And if you don't get in expunged. any trouble and then, yeah. Okay. And he wanted to know how I did that, how I could afford a lawyer, all that kind of stuff. He's like, well, well who are you working with? Really just grilling me, you know? And then. So that ends. They take me to the jail. And this place, is, they tore it down. It's not even there anymore. It's called the Don Jail. And the place was really, really dangerous. But luckily, there was uh, some guys in there that were customers of mine that recognized me. And I treated them really well. So they made sure nobody bothered me while I was in there and took care of me. But I had to spend uh, 30 days in there. And uh, How much pot were you caught with? And I wasn't caught with much. It was like a quarter ounce. But because I was American, they wanted to try to really like, you know, nail me with it, you know? And he, I mean, here I'm doing all this big business. They catch me with like peanuts. You know what I mean? But it, it so I get out of there or while I was in there, I guess, um, I just played cards and read books, right. you know? And just dealt with it, you know. Um, Do they extradite you or they just drop the charges? So, or? Well, that ends up happening later. Um, so life goes on. for. Well, I signed a promise, a paper promising to leave the country within like 90 days. Right. But I never left. I just kept doing what I was doing and just kind of put it behind me. Well, then I got caught the second time and the jail that they took me to was like a detention center before you go to the the prison is right next door and people are begging to be sentenced they the conditions in this place it's you're locked down two hours you're out for two hours you're locked in for two hours you're locked out for two hours there were a bunch of guys there um that were facing extradition to the u.s because they're victims, like we were talking about earlier, we're um, Americans. Right. So they're coming to America. They've never even been to the U.S. before, and they're facing extradition. So there's a bunch of us in there. Um, for me, I guess I got lucky because my uh, meal was vegan. It came in a brown, uh, a light brown um, um, tray. It stood apart from all the others, and that's how the guys in the kitchen were smuggling in stuff onto our range. So in exchange, and then I had a vegan diet, so I got the uh, protein uh, powder. It was like almond milk or soy milk, and then I got peanut butters, the, the seal on them, right. which they only got like once a week. I got two every meal. So the bodybuilders wanted those. Right. So they, you know, they gave me all their extra like veggie and stuff like that and made sure I was taken care of. I had a ton of fruit. I gave away a bunch of fruit when I left. But um, so their basic thing was they made me go to uh, 
immigration court, uh, a tribunal, I guess, while I was there at the jail. So I'd have to go upstairs to like another floor and they just, they'd state their case, let me state my case. And then the other one decides my fate. And they kept just turning me down, turning me down, turning me down. So I'm like, look, I just want to go back home to the US. So what they did is they took me to the border. Uh, well, they, I had to finish out. Um, they, the, the lawyer said to me, he said, do you want to plea and um, try to stay? And then maybe you might do a little time, but it'll be like a misdemeanor kind of thing. And then maybe we could find some way for you to be able to stay in Canada. And I said, well, I've already been in here for 30 days. He, I said, doesn't that um, count as time served? And he says, no, because you, uh, you got bail and the immigration put a hold on you. So the whole time you've been in here, it's been an immigration hold. Okay. So, so it's, not, it's not counting towards your sentence. Not at all. So what they did is they went in and basically said, look, he's already done his time. You know, why don't we just let this go and let him get on with his life? And they came and picked me up, two armed guards. They were armed uh, um, guys from immigration. They just took me to the border, um, said this is, was our prisoner, blah, blah, blah. And they unhandcuffed me. And then the Americans were like, okay, welcome to America. I'm like, well, where do I go from here? Good luck. So, you know. I had to come back sort of under those conditions. But up there, you know, I got to live a pretty good life. You know, I'd smoke weed with Woody Harrelson, like that picture I sent you, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Meet all kinds of crazy people. Charlie Sheen, we got a whole bunch of people to come out and um, have a rally for him. And, like, they did a press release. It was 90% like paparazzi. I'd never seen that before in my life. It was, this was wild. in Canada? This was in Toronto. In Toronto? Yeah. yeah. See, I was going between Toronto and Montreal picking up weed. So, I... Uh, I was in both those cities. Um, I'd pick up hash. And that's how I got Woody's attention because the hash I was getting, people hadn't seen since high school unless they go over to Afghanistan. Right. And he so, lives there or he was just uh, visiting? No, he was um, um, doing a play at the time. Okay. Yeah, it was around the time True Detective came out. Yeah, if you remember that series that he did it might have been hbo i don't know what it was. i mean I was, I, I, what what year was this with matthew mcconaughey so ooh, 20 maybe 2012 2013 something well, like that i was that. locked up so yeah okay so yeah you were uh i mean i've heard the series but i don't i don't oh okay yeah i watched it for that okay. sake you know yeah a lot of the guys i um i sold the the coke too and the weed too they were uh, a lot of them worked behind the scenes sound guys tech guys audio guys and then that's how i got ultimately you know plugged in with that and uh doing all that business before i got out and it's funny because i got out i wasn't i was i got out of the business it took me a while to phase out because life was good you know i was really enjoying it you know just the weed alone i i did the math it was I had probably a million and a half in business every year. And I was taking a good cut on that. Right. You know, I was, I was paying very little for it. I, um, what I did is because I guess, uh, one way I got in and got my prices so low is we found a doctor willing to sign, um, licenses to possess and licenses to grow before it became legal. So he fills out the form. Most doctors won't do it. This guy will do it for two fifty, just kind of. You know, right. hush, hush. So what we, what my buddy decided to do, he's running a dispensary, is just get a van load of them and then up the rate. And I would find the people. Kind of like doctor shop. Well, yeah. exactly like doctor shopping, right? Yeah. Like, are you going to, is, or are you really just going to one doctor? So it's not really. Yeah. Shop. But yeah. we go to this doctor, but nobody knew how to get this doctor. All we say is we can get you signed. You're going to see our doctor. And they would drive up to his clinic, and his clinic was like rural Ontario. So they were charging five, six hundred bucks a person instead of the two fifty that they pay that right. the doctor charges. And then um, my job was to find those people, get them to sign their grow licenses over to us. So he signs a grow license. Say they can grow a hundred plants, fifty plants, two hundred plants. 
they sign the grow license over to us. We grow for them and we give them a couple grand a month, a few grand a month and some weed. And they're happy with that. And then we make all the extra money. So I was getting kickbacks from that. So, um, they got, it got so bad with this doctor that they were renting hotels, like the, uh, right. The big room where you'd have your reception or whatever, you know, these banquet rooms or whatever and set it up and there'd be people coming and there'd be maybe 10 people scheduled per hour. And they're just coming in. The nurse makes sure all your paperwork is right. Everything's correct and in its place. And then he, you go see him behind a curtain, give him the money. Some people give him more if they want to hire him out. But um, then you're able to carry it and possess large amounts. So for dealers, it was a gold mine and for everybody else. So they did a news special and exposed him because I guess some people didn't want to pay the 250 bucks. He was the only Canadian doctor ever, um, actually he was American, but the only doctor in Canada to ever um, get arrested while on the emergency room floor. He was the primary care guy they didn't know what to do do we take the guy do we take the primary doctor away from emergency room to arrest him because he had signed so many people and he was going like out of province to do it and i guess that's a no-no you're supposed to sign within your province so what happened to him he did he go to jail in canada um yeah okay. i think so and a bunch of fines but there it's not much, you right. know. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna do a lot of time, you know. Yeah, but know. It, it was like, um, you got that hustler mentality, you know. You're just moving, and you got people coming, and all you just have to do is sign, and here's the money, and you're just, you know. I guess it's hard to say no. You renew it every year, you know. It's like, you know, you know the guy's gonna come back, you know. So when 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 you left Canada, where'd you go? When you came back to the U.S.? So I went and I um, stayed with some family for a little while in New York. And I was just like, "This I, I can't take this. So I went uh, out to Washington State and I worked out in uh, Seattle. And uh, I got a job doing, uh, like, as an ambassador downtown, going and giving people directions. In the morning, I had to wake people up that were sleeping in the doorways, then call a cleanup crew to come in and clean up all the crap because the city of Seattle was so bad with drugs and stuff. A person would be sleeping there and then they'd get up and there'd be needles everywhere and things like that. So you have to learn how to kind of work with those people and, and make people um, comfortable, you know, because they're living pretty rough lives there. I mean, there's tents in the middle of, you know, um, the the street you know in those little laneways right. there that you know the tree row used to be you know there's tents in between and what year was this so this was 2017 yeah how long did you do that so i did that for like a year and then i went out to one of the islands out there in the san juan islands and i worked out there and i worked at a restaurant and uh on a resort and uh i did that for a while and i came to florida i was just traveling um you get laid off for the winter months because it's seasonal out there. And then I was planning on going to Mexico and then COVID came and uh, I got sick 2019. Uh, well, just 2020, like a couple days before New Year's is when it hit me. I got really sick. Like everybody in my restaurant, we all got sick. So we believe it was COVID, but we didn't know at the time. So then they started to talk about it on the news and everything. And I was in Southern California and I was like, well, crap, I better not go to Mexico. I might not be able to get it back or be able to get back across the border. So I went and I traveled around and I came to Florida and went all over Florida, like uh, to the Keys. I went down to Miami, South Beach, every place I wanted to see, Clearwater, you know. And um, um, I decided, you know, because I had to figure out well, what am I going to do? What's what's my plan now? You know, what do I want to do? And what I realized is in my old life, everybody had respect. Everybody was pleasant. You know, you didn't have to worry about people lying. You know, you didn't have to worry about, you know, people being underhanded, you know, and that kind of thing. You know, um, you're dealing with kind of dangerous people, you know, you, you just don't do that anyway. You know, there's just there's something like a code okay. you know and and my goal was i like to garden i like to cook 
I like healthy food. A lot of the guys that I work with, they're getting older, they got young girlfriends, or now they have grandkids or whatever. All of a sudden, the reckless lives, you know, are catching up with them. You know, we we're talking about earlier, you know, you feel things when you get a certain age. Yeah. So they, I was helping them to, to shop and to cook and uh, garden and things like that, try to take my garden expertise and turn it into, you know, healthy living. So what I want, what my goal is now, I guess what my plan is, what I've been trying to work on, I guess for the last little while is to put together like that little sanctuary where I have the flotation place, where I have the right. sauna, where I have a nice garden, but uh, you could have skills training and things like that. Because if, if you got that mindset to go out there and hustle and make money, you know, selling whatever, and, you know, knowing your clientele and how to make money and, and, you know, that kind of thing. You can train people to do that in honest businesses, you know, and make really good money at it, you know. So where are you living now though? So I'm in St. Augustine. Oh, okay. But I'm looking some um, central Florida maybe to do something like this. Okay. You know, put together like a spiritual center or something, you know. I, I'm a Christian, but I I don't always want to impose that on anybody, you know. I'd rather talk like Jesus than about Jesus, you know. So you want to buy a few acres and yeah, just a few acres. Put some nice fruit trees out there, you know, grow vegetables. It's like printing your own money anyway, you know. I mean, I go to Whole Foods or I go to the grocery store. St. Augustine, wow. It's like a food desert there. You really can't find a whole lot of stuff. You know, it's um no like exotic fruits and things like that are really hard to come by. Um, vegan food, healthy food, it's really pricey, you know restaurants are geared toward tourists so it's like going to disney you know and trying to like you know it's the same type of food you know that people you're on vacation who cares you know you're gonna eat fatty food and you're gonna eat junk right. food and all that kind of stuff you know well what are you doing for work though right now so for work um yeah just i work at a hotel I do maintenance and work at a store at night you know just basically i, I do personal chef work a lot of personal chef work too. So I just, you know, I just wanted to sort of readapt, you know, just like slowly, you know, I, I, I got used to that life out there, but it got, you know, it got me in a lot of trouble. I'm ready to make my second fortune and be responsible with it, you know? All right. Yeah. yeah me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. If possible. Well, yeah. Do you have anything else you can think of or you feel like, Feel good about this or? Oh yeah, I, I'm right. really having a good time. This is fantastic, yeah. And, and your art, man, it just blows my mind. Wow, wow. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, art was a way in Toronto that a lot of people um, hid money. <laughs> you know, now there's I see no, it. There's no money in my art, I promise. <laughs> you know, <laughs> worth a thousand to you, five thousand to the next guy, you know. It's good for taxes. I got people, uh, people, it's funny though, people do, they still, you know, even though we're like we took the, the paintings off the walls, like we're not really running any commercials or anything, but I still have like an Etsy account and a few times a month people order stuff. Wow. That's fantastic. You know, which is great. Cause we don't advertise. I don't do anything. I don't know if these are people just seeing older stuff, but people do keep subscribe or following me on Instagram. I have like Cox pop art. I have a bunch of stuff on Instagram. And, uh, you know, people are constantly, I, I don't know why I haven't posted anything on there in, in a while, you know, I kind of have these modified screen prints that I, I produce now. And, uh, so like the custom artwork I haven't really been doing, I need to I actually need to, there's, you see the nuns yeah. above the, I need to sell those okay. because, because my wife doesn't like them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> All she's right. like, you know, you've got. Well, I guess, you know, two women in, you know, whatever they're like bondage gear, you know, with, you know, holding crosses. They're not, they're, they're nuns in bondage gear. And then one's like a woman in ecstasy, yeah. but they're all, they're all kind of like a set. And she's like, she's like, you, you can't, we can't have this. You gotta, you gotta get rid of them. And I, I would get rid of them. Like, I feel like I've discounted them <laughs> dramatically. You know, the problem, wow. the problem is young guys who probably would like, like them. Right. You know, don't want to spend a thousand dollars on it. Oh, uh, okay. So, so, and then somebody who's older and established typically have a wife and kids, and they're like, I'm "Right, putting that in here." 
So I'm, I have a feeling that they're going to be dramatically reduced <laughs> or maybe they just end up in the garage. Oh, I'm about to paint, so I would just oh, man. suck. Yeah. Original Matt Cox artwork. No, no man, no, not in the I'm garage. Just, just put something up there. That's more benign. That's too bad. Yeah. Well, art is subjective, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It would seem like a good idea when it was just going to be, when this place, this house was going to be me. It was just going to be me and a bunch of, um, I'm going to go with, I'm like, I'll say YouTubers, content creators, okay. a bunch of content creators. And like all down here, there was going to be no living room or anything. Everything down here was just going to be studios. Right. And then all the, the bedrooms would be like, we, we, you know, it would be like four guys upstairs. And then all down here was all going to be just studio space. It didn't work out. It was a great idea. And I had it going well, really, really was headed toward that. And then, uh, you know, then my current wife okay. decided that she's really, it does love me and she's in love with me and she wants to move in. And Oh, okay. Who are these guys? They have to go. No, they actually, they didn't even move in. <laughs> Only one guy moved in. Um, and then the other two guys, stuff happened in their lives. One okay. guy moved to Miami. He had fallen in love and didn't want to tell me. He paid the rent. He paid his part of the rent for like three months and wouldn't tell me. He just kept paying it. I was like, bro, you're not moving in. Why aren't you moving in? You keep sending me money. What's going on? You got to move in. He's like, Finally, I said, bro, what's going on? Don't, don't. Just tell me what's happening. Yeah. Like you paying the rent wasn't the point. The point was is you'd have four guys in the house and we could all kind of work together. Yeah. And, right. And you're just not here. So let me rent the room out to somebody else. And he said, yeah, man, I'm sorry, man. I'm this chick that I used to date came back a few months ago and I'm in love. And I think I want, I want to move to Miami. I didn't know how to tell you. I was like, oh my God. So he moved to Miami. The other guy was in the middle of getting a divorce and he was supposed to move in. Wow. And he ended up like kind of getting hooked on drugs again and just became a, a complete lunatic, which I, oh. I don't know why. And, and it, it may have been a misunderstanding on my part. When I met the guy, I thought he'd been sober for for like five or six years. But then when the when he kind of went off the deep end, I found out, no, no, he'd only been sober for six months to a year. Wow. So it was like and and he had never been sober for more than let's say a year. And I was like, oh no, like I didn't know that. Like I can't have you, you can't move in here. You yeah. Know, you're a lunatic. Yeah. Um, wow. And he's not the kind of sober that like or not the kind of addict that stays to himself he's the kind of addict that goes out and wrecks his car or you know gets into a fight or passes out in public or gets arrested like he's constantly getting arrested for stupid stuff but it doesn't matter you can't get you can't you yeah. can't come here and get arrested you can't be doing that here yeah like, bring I all kinds of heat and attention right. and i can't take on your your i can't take on the the tragedy of your life when i'm trying to put the tragedy of my life back together right so uh that didn't work out Anyway, she moved back in. Then her daughter moved in. Now we're kind of like a little family. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they both have attitudes. Two two chicks together. It's no fair. Yeah, There's that's no, true. Just ganging up on you. Yeah. It's no good. It's no yeah. good. Yeah, it's a team you can I'm, never beat. Yeah, a wedge you can never never create. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I'm always the bad guy. I'm always the guy <laughs> in Target. And they're like, oh my God, wouldn't this be great? This it would be great. And when we get a house someday- we're going to get one of those. But for now, <laughs> put it back. Oh, my God. It's it's only $49. Would you have $49? No. Put it back. You know, I right. mean, it's just so I'm just, I'm always, I'm the consummate asshole, you know, which is fine. That's fine. Yeah. Like for me, um, the way I always dealt with that with my, with my ex when I was in Canada was I, you um, don't tell me what something costs. If we need it, just go get it. I don't want to know. For me, yeah, I, I couldn't do it. We're gonna get tickets. You're gonna I, get me uh, a, a shirt, a bag, whatever. Don't tell me. Yeah, well, I'm I'm in the position. Where, well, I'm I'm and I'm, now you. I'm just in the position where I I, I just need to save money at some yeah. point. I need to get. I can't be renting. I'm just too old to be renting a house. I need to buy something. I need yeah, like we were talking about earlier. You know, I need to find. I need to go get half an acre or an acre. I need to be able to buy a house. I need to be able to put some, get some rental units or something. You know what I'm saying? Like Absolutely. trying to plan for your retirement in your fifties is stupid. 
You know what oh, I'm saying? I like know that it is. you should be reti- planning that in your 30s. So you get, I get, you know, I leave prison and it's like, okay, put your life back together and prepare to be able to retire within the next 10 to 15 years. It's like, oh my God, like everything has to go right. You can't make any mistakes. Yeah. And that means you don't buy the the $49 plastic Santa because exactly. we don't need the plastic Santa. Right. That's why we get a house and things are more structured and things are coming, money's coming in and everything's good. We can get a plastic Santa, but not right now. Exactly. Not right now. Yeah, I I I, I, I want a plastic everything. Santa. I do. Right. I'm not a bad person. <laughs> You're not the great. I, I, right. I just. <laughs> yeah. Bye. So I hear you. Yeah. I was, it was a long time. It was a long time ago when I was like, "What? Buy it? Sure. Yeah. Who it, cares? I don't care what it costs." Yeah, I'm That's sure it was that way I, for you when you were doing your. Of course, thing. especially yeah. when I was using somebody else's credit card. I was like, "Yeah, we'll put it on. We'll put on Lee Black's credit card." Whoosh, yeah, fifteen hundred dollars. Of course, I'm. Just, I'm shocked that I didn't buy you one of those earlier. I'm so, I'm embarrassed that you had to ask me. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's over. That's over, bro. <laughs> to say she now, looked like a million bucks was an understatement. Yeah. You know. <laughs> now it's like fifteen hundred for a purse. No. no. Oh. Oh, I know. I know. Same here. That's why I'm single. I'm like, I can't afford to date like this. <laughs> I don't even drink. I can't afford the scotch I got used to in that life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Good times. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know. Oh, yeah. Listen, there were guys I was locked up with that were Canadian that had, you know, they run a run some kind of like a, I want to say a Ponzi scheme. Really, they were just like stealing from people, you know, yeah. and, and they were running some kind of a scam. And then they would end up they would end up getting arrested in the United States right? and be sentenced in the United States. And they're sitting there like, I'm a Canadian citizen. And, and it was, okay, I understand you were running your little scam out of Canada, but you were stealing from Americans. Yeah. So they would get like 12 years or something. They'd be like, this is insane. And they would go to go to trial. And they'd go, which, because in Canada, they'll these guys will go to trial. Well, of course, because yeah. even if you lose, you're looking at three years. Like they went to trial, they would lose, they'd get, 10 or 12 years and the whole time they would be screaming for five or six years about how they wanted to be uh they wanted to go back they want to be transfer a treaty transfer back to canada because they, they finished their sentence there right well because as soon as they get there they, they put them they put them on probation to let them go so this one guy I remember he did um he did he did like whatever it was five or six years complain the whole time and they did actually transfer him after you so, so sorry you have to serve fifty percent of your U.S. citizen, um, your U.S. sentence okay. before you can be transferred. Oh, okay. So he got he immediately got transferred, and then this is the worst thing. What people don't realize is they don't send a couple of Canadian Mounties to pick you up and drive you back there. You're now you have to go through immigration. Immigration uh, prisons are the worst. Like these guys, like he was, he was mailing letters back to his old celly saying like, you have no idea how horrible it is here. These guys are stabbing each other left and right. They're, they're locked down. Like it's like, you're, be- I would, you're begging to be locked down because yeah. it's, it's just extremely violent. They're all crammed in there. They have no rights. Oh I mean, no. You know, so if at least you have some semblance of rights in a U.S. prison, but now you're in. Now you're kind of in this limbo. So he was there for another three to six months before he got transferred. And as soon as he got there, within 10 days, he's at home on an ankle monitor. Wow. You know? Okay. So it it, but it really it did save him several years by transferring, probably three or four years uh, by transferring. But yeah, there were tons of guys that were begging to be transferred. Like, get me back to Mexico. Why? Because in Mexico, I can get myself sprung. Yeah, Absolutely. Family bring you food. Girlfriend come stay with well, you for a week. N- not just that. You know what would what would happen? Some of these cartel guys would get locked up. Mm-hmm. So the cartel guy gets locked up in the U.S. and he gets a sentence for ten years. And I only know this because of my buddy Pete would do their legal work. Okay. And he what his specialty was, you know, they would first of all they're cartel guys or they're working with the cartel, so they already know I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to prison. Like, right. this is just a part of it. I'm going to do some prison time. Maybe it'll be in the U.S. Maybe it'll be in Canada. Maybe it will be in in Colombia. Maybe it'll be Mexico, where somewhere I'm going to end up doing some time. So they expect it. So he said that was a great thing about working with them was they had a good attitude. They okay. knew. They didn't complain. They knew right. it. 
was coming. So they never got there and had and, and you had to listen to them bitch and moan for for an hour and a half every day about how they shouldn't be locked up. No, no, I should be locked up. I just need to limit it. So here's what would happen is the cartel guys, if they had money, they get locked up, they get whatever. Let's say they get 15 years. Right. Around around five or six years, they would put in and they would get themselves charged in Mexico. So they bribe a a politician or a their equivalent of a, an attorney, a U.S. attorney, right. to file charges in Mexico and ask for them to be extradited to face those charges. Okay. My buddy Pete would put in the paperwork to try and get them extradited. So he would satisfy any outstanding warrants or detainers they had in the United States so they could get extradited back to Mexico. And once they were back in Mexico, that, like I said, their equivalent of a U.S. attorney drops the charges. Wow. So you got 15 years and like in five years, six years, he said they would never do it right away. They'd wait. They'll do five or six years because they knew they knew the U.S. government would would put up a fight if it was Right. right away. You have to wait. So they wait five, six years. Boom, they put it in. At some point, I'll have my buddy Pete on. He, he has countless examples of this. Wow, of, just a long-term plan. Yeah, they just they just know it going in. They right. know what's, you know, or someone like me, like I just never, I never thought I was going to see the inside of a prison. So I was right. totally unprepared. Right. And you know, when it happened to me, I was just like, oh my God. But these, these guys go in, their families know they're going to go in. They send them, they send them a little bit of money. They, they, they answer their phone calls. They come and see them. Like it's just a part of their culture. It, right. You know, the, that kind of that life, that cartel culture, not Mexican car- culture. Right. You know, so I'm just trying to be clear. Yeah, don't um, like <laughs> I don't want to insult anybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, you're living a, a right. decent life in Mexico. You don't expect to go to jail, but, right. but these guys, uh, so, it's just like royalty. They just live uh, on a different lane, you know. That's it. Oh, listen, and then they would go. That they would go to. They they have certain prisons for the cartel, or they have wings of wow. the prison for the cartel, where like they they live like kings. Yeah, you know, like the mob guys here. Yeah, know? but I'm not sure. Well, no, they probably still, even they better. Yeah, different. They they live way better, but they live differently. Like the mob guys here will come and they'll go to jail, and what they do is. It's funny because I'm supposed to interview this guy okay. who's kind of like a, a connected guy. Um, but I mean, I was locked up with guys that were like, you know, made men. Sure. And and what happens is they get in there and they get a regular cell, but they'll very quickly get themselves moved to a nicer cell. So they'll go from like a three-man room to a two-man room. Then they'll get whoever they want to move in with them. And okay. sometimes they don't get another equivalent mob guy. They get a lower le- a low-level guy that takes care of them. Okay. They put money on their books. They put money on, on on other people's books. So those people go to commissary for them. They cook their food. They clean their cell. They make their bed. They do their laundry. These guys basically walk the track. They make phone calls. They write letters. They watch movies. Like they, it's not a, like it's a, an amazing life, but it's the best possible life you could have in in those a prison. circumstances. Yeah. Right. Wow. You've got people if it, you're in. If you're in a penitentiary and you've got a life sentence, then you've got people protecting you. Nobody bothers you. Nobody, you know. So if it's a low security, then you basically you just have people catering to you all the time, making you dinner, uh, stealing stuff out of the out of the chow hall to feed you, preparing food, doing your, you know, doing the stuff that that the average inmate would do for himself. Right. They don't have to do that. They don't have to sweep the. They don't have to sweep their room. They don't have to wipe everything down. They don't have to, you know, clean their toilets or or do it. You know, somebody's doing all that. Somebody's making their bed. Somebody's doing their laundry. Doing everything. Wow. Somebody will even keep stuff in their locker because your locker's your. It's packed. Right. So these guys, you, they'll open their locker, and it's like opening up a, um, you, you like a like a dresser drawers or something where it's like everything's nice and neat and prim, uh, and pressed and lined up. And it's like, this guy has nothing but clothes in his locker. Like where's all of his other stuff? Where's all of his, his coffee, his creamer, his chips, his, his food, where's, you know, his, whatever snacks, where's his legal work? Where are his books? Where's his <laughs> photos? Where, where's his photo album? Like all these things that people have to keep in their locker. He didn't have any of that. He does. Right, but his cell he keeps some like some is in this guy's locker. Some he has is dispersed. Wow. 
So he gets to live this very nice, clean cut, pressed, uh, no stress life from within the prison. So he's doing different time than, than everybody else. Yeah, than everybody else's. Yeah. Wow. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor. If you like the video, please share the video, hit the bell so you get, or subscribe, hit the bell so you get notified, share the video to anybody else that you think might like it. Also leave me a comment in the comment section. Please check out my social media links and consider joining my Patreon. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you. See ya.